Oh, hey, we're live. We are. Hello. Hey, right. internets. <laughs> <laughs> Am I supposed to just start talking? Right, no. I was just checking that the stream is actually there on the other machine. So, blah, 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 blah. I have no idea if we are. Uh, if we already have an audience, but uh, assuming that we do, hello everybody, and we continue our journey around the 24 hours today on GAAD, and we've got Adrian Rossetti here, my fairly recent colleague here at TPG, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass you on to Adrian, or oh, I'm going to mention quickly, if you've got any questions, as uh, before in the sessions, just tweet them to uh, at Paciello Group and hashtag them ID24, and we'll get to the questions at the end of the session. And if I can now work it out, I'll pass this on to Adrian. Okay. If I can work it out, just a second. Just talk as if. I should just start talking as if. <laughs> I'll do that. Um, hey, okay, that somebody disappeared, so I think it's just me on the screen now. Um, I'm going to put my slides up on the screen, and what I think is the upper right corner, I'll have the hashtag. So when this gets replaced. Hey, um, Patrick, if you are, I'm hearing an echo here, so I don't know if that's from your microphone. Oh, no, it's probably not. Okay. So anyway, um, I'm going to jump into this talk just as soon as I kill the other window I have that is broadcasting me at the same time. That was my fault. I'm an idiot. Okay, so get on to sharing my screen. And here we go. Okay, so you have chosen to give up an hour of your life to hear me talk about fringe accessibility techniques. That probably shouldn't be. Um, in the bottom left corner, you see the hashtag, the ID24, and as we dive into the talk, I put that hashtag at the top, so use that if you have questions. I'm not monitoring Twitter, but the kind folks who are moderating, namely Patrick and Ian, will ostensibly let me know. They're probably going to have to break in because I'm not monitoring this any other way. So um, I have a couple slides that will address um, my ego, as I like to say. Uh, I think it's fair if you're going to be spending some of your day listening to somebody prattle on about uh, interweb stuff, you should get a sense of what they know. So I have one slide that says, look, I've, I've co-written some books, I've been a technical editor, I've written a bunch of articles for Evolt, for Web Standards Sherpa. Um, if you know Evolt and you participated in Evolt, good for you, you're from my generation. If you've never heard of Evolt, we should chat later. Um, I am an invited expert with the W3C. I have HTML working group in an asterisk there because the uh, the name of the group has changed, but that's mostly irrelevant. So I've been doing this web thing since um, 93, and I had my own uh, software business, consultancy, etc., for 20 years. So been down that road. Now I'm hanging out with these guys at TPG, and they're nice enough to let me do things like this. Um, I will post my slides afterward. I will include a URL for that. I have a, a Twitter handle, Ardrian. You might have heard of me. Hopefully not. You can start blocking me now. So you've probably been seeing a lot of um, information over the last few hours uh, about accessibility and um, seeing the hashtag, et cetera, pounding around the web. So the first thing I wanted to address is what is the A11Y? Um, and I start off pretty much all of my talks with this because it's, um, it's common that I'm speaking to a room full of people who just don't have uh, practical experience with accessibility, don't necessarily know what that ha what the, um, the numeronym in this case means. And that's what A11Y is, it's a numeronym. You take the word accessibility, you replace everything but the first and last letter, and you replace that with the number of characters that you have emitted. And it's really handy when you are using it on Twitter, uh, because of the character restriction obviously. And you'll see the hashtag A11Y is, is pretty prominent. It's a great way to jump into conversations, ask questions, get help, um, complain about ARIA roles, states, and properties, et cetera. Um, there are examples of numeronyms out there before, like localization, which is L10N, and internationalization, which is I18N. So you can jump into these pretty much any time uh, as hashtags on Twitter and get to learn all sorts of things that might be more than you bargained for. So my presentation this morning is broken up into three 
three broad sections. Uh, common techniques we're going to dive into in a moment. Then I'm going to talk about all the fringe items, and then I'll have a couple uh, takeaways from this talk. I'm also going to stop regularly <clears throat> to uh, take a drink of water because it is earlier in the day than my body is used to being um, active. So, common techniques. I'm guessing for the most part that uh, people have been listening to these uh, presentations or you already know about things like clicking on field labels. A uh, nice testing technique to make sure the corresponding field gets focus. You use the label element to make that happen. Um, and all of the hard mapping is, is taken for of you, taken care of for you by the browser, which is pretty awesome. Um, unplugging your mouse is one of my favorite ways to test software, um, to screw with coworkers or former coworkers, and to make sure that the tab order of the page uh, makes sense and I can get to all of the elements. Uh, another common technique uh, for testing or otherwise is to turn off images. Great way to see if the page still makes sense to see if there is alternative text um, to make sure that content hasn't dramatically disappeared or meaning of what you're seeing doesn't fall apart. Uh, another common technique is to turn off CSS. If you can still use the page without CSS, you know, barring some, some obvious restrictions, then you're probably in good shape. Uh, that tends to imply that the, uh, the page flows naturally, that it has a structure that makes sense that things are grouped together like navigation might be, not embedded in the middle of your content, etc. cetera. Um, checking color contrast. Um, there are a lot of really nifty tools out there. This is pretty common. I see people asking this question a lot. I see a proliferation of tools for checking color contrast. Um, so I know that people are talking about this and thinking about this on a pretty regular basis. Um, considering the hyperlink text, it's, I consider this a common technique. It's not just about plain language, but it's also about making sure you're managing expectations. You're telling users they're about to download uh, an 8 megabyte PDF of your restaurant menu, for example. Um, you tell them if they're going off-site. You maybe use the same text if you're going to link to that 8 megabyte menu PDF every time so the user doesn't keep clicking something and thinking they're going to get something new and exciting. So those are, those are common techniques, I think, for the most part. Um, developers in general are familiar with them or have heard of them. Whether you call them alt tags or alt attributes, at least you might know what they are. So I'm going to dive into the things that I find tend to be on the fringe of um, accessibility, but, but they really aren't. Um, and bear with me as I take another long drink of water. That's got to sound terrible on the microphone. Okay, so the first, uh, the first thing I like to talk about is using link underlines. It is amazing how many organizations, uh, how many websites, how many designers, etc., really, really want to turn off link underlines. So I've put a, I've put a screenshot up on uh, on the screen right now, and it shows a page from The Verge that talks about Google removing link underlines, and I show it through three different. Um, uh, color blindness filters, protonopia, deuteronopia, and tritonopia, as well as uh, how it appears without any of those. And I've called attention to um, a couple items on the screen. One that's a, a box with a little tiny box above all the comments that uh, I've circled, and that is orange. And then at the bottom, where it shows the number of comments, that is also orange. And I circled these because all the link text on the page is orange. And while this isn't the best example I could find, it's left over from another talk and perfectly easy to do in time for this. Uh, the, the point here is I'm showing you can see that the orange text is probably a hyperlink because of the content that appears above it. But as you look around on the page and you see more text, does that mean every time you see orange text that it is a hyperlink? And this is a great example of not knowing. So you might as well have just not colored the text, or you might as well not have colored your hyperlinks, because your users are probably still going to be hovering around on the page trying to figure out what is what. Um, as I've argued before, ultimately you're not Google. And if you're dumping underlines, um, you're making an assumption that your users know your interface. Users know Google, so when Google dumped underlines, it wasn't as big of a deal. People are already familiar with how it flows. So. If you're not using underlines, that means you're relying probably on color alone. You might be doing other things. You might have the text 
flash or turn upside down or something. I don't know. Uh, but if you're relying on color alone, that's not going to that's not going to work, especially when it comes to satisfying uh, web content accessibility guidelines uh, criteria, specifically 141 and 143, which talk about how much contrast you need to have between text and its background and text and hyperlinks. So three to one is probably the best ratio between text and a hyperlink, and I refer you to the uh, guideline 183 if you're interested in uh, in reading some more on that and potentially disagreeing with me, which you're welcome to do. Uh, certainly because 4.5 to 1 contrast between text and the background copy is already pretty strong, and getting that between your body text and your hyperlink can be a bit tricky. Um, I should note that these slides, when I post them, there will be links to all of these, so you don't have to remember everything, and if, like me, you're a bit groggy and you've forgotten what I'm talking about, you will be able to refresh yourself, um, something I won't be able to do for an hour. Okay, uh, the next one. Use focus styles, and this, this kind of ties into the hyperlink thing. And on the screen right now, it might be a little bit hard to see, but this is an animated GIF. And you can tell by looking in the bottom left corner, oh, and the, the screen just jumped a bit, which is good. This is an animated GIF of me on the Virgin America website using the tab key. And all I'm trying to do as a user is figure out where I am as I'm tabbing through the page. The only clue that anything is happening is because the status bar and the bottom left corner of the browser window keeps changing to tell me that I'm cycling through things. And it's not until I'm partway through the page that it jumps. And in doing that, I finally get a sense that, oh, okay, I'm actually navigating this page. Um, so I'll leave this up for another moment. You can see a bunch of the links have just the hash in them, and then boom, it jumps. Very difficult for me to figure out what's going on. And apparently I have this slide twice. I do. So if you've removed link underlines, which you shouldn't have because I talked about that, then you really need to figure out how you're going to do focus styles. Um, one simple technique that I have found works pretty well is everywhere you have a hover style, every time you have the colon hover selector in your CSS, add the colon focus selector. That's probably the quickest and most efficient way to do it. It's not going to cover every scenario but at the very least is going to make sure that everywhere you've set hover styles, somebody who's tabbing around on the page can still see the effect. Um, if you are using third-party libraries, um, CSS resets, for example, go look for colon focus and see if you see outline none. Anywhere you see outline none, maybe remove that. Just take it out of there, throw it away. Um, it doesn't need to be there, and a lot of those are left over from people who got overly designy and did not like the, the dotted outline that the browser threw in by default. Uh, the nice thing is this is really easy to test. Open the page, start using the tab key. If you can't tell where you are, you got a problem, and you need to look at that focus style. And if there's no outline at all, you might want to put it back in. Um, certainly that, that duplication of um, not just a hover style, but also having the outline is a, is a pretty handy cue anyway because there's uh, no mouse cursor to give you a clue otherwise as a typical mouse user might have. Um, jumping on to the next one. Use headings wisely. Um, it's kind of a broad statement, but in general, think about your headings, heading one through six, as a way of um, imparting structure to your page, I like to refer to it as sort of a bullet list of the content of your page. So I have a screenshot from a blog post I wrote, and next to that screenshot is an image of the heading structure of the page. And you can see that the H1 is the title of the page, and then I have H2s for subsections, and H3s for subsections of those subsections. And I have other posts where I'll use an H4 because it goes even deeper with the nesting, etc. Uh, by the way, for those who are wondering how I'm showing those headlines, there's a really cool um, IE-specific web accessibility toolbar you can get from the Pasiello group. And I can quickly jump into the heading outline of a page and see what the structure looks like. Um, I think it's worth noting that I'm a fan of using only one H1 per page. 
primarily because H1 refers to the content of the page. And for the most part, a web page is about one thing. Um, especially if it's a content-driven page, you're, you're either writing about chihuahuas or you're writing about dogs, but you're probably not writing about um, chihuahuas and burritos. Although now I want a chihuahua burrito. So having two H1s can throw off what the whole meaning of the page is. Um, I typically like to match my H1 to my title element anyway, so they correspond. Definitely don't skip heading levels. So don't go from an H1 to an H4. Uh, if you're making the decision because the H4 is small enough and it fits your styles better, that's the wrong decision. Uh, because ultimately, if you're making a decision based on how it looks, you're putting the wrong structure in there. And you're kind of messing up the, messing up the nesting of the headings on that page. Um, ultimately, you might read articles somewhere that talk about the document outline algorithm and how you can reset with H1s anytime you use a section or an article or a header or a footer. Um, there is no document outline algorithm. It's been pretty thoroughly debunked in insofar as no browser supports it. So it's kind of pointless to give it a go. Um, a tip I like to give people is if you are using an H1 in every new section or article, then you probably are doing something wrong. Um, in particular, using H1s too many times. Um, it doesn't affect your search engine ranking. Contrary to, to many beliefs, the search engines really don't do anything with additional H1s on a page, uh, particularly because they're looking at the, the H1 versus the title. Um, fun fact, by the way, in, first, in the first version of Mosaic, when you could take a look at the structure of a page, they had provisions for H7. It was in the menu. I don't know what it did. I'm thinking that if you ever used an H7 on anything, the internet turned itself inside out because it was the 90s. Probably a dedicated server just for serving H7s. Um, use only one main element per page. If you do not know what the main element is, it is essentially the container for the main content of your page. It's amazing how self-explanatory that element is. If your page is about burritos, everything that talks about the burritos should probably live in a main. Anything that's about the, um, the navigation probably lives in the nav element. Header, footer, et cetera, they're pretty self-explanatory. But what's key is using only one main element per page. It maps directly to a role. And, and while you can have multiples, the, the problem is that you're, the users who rely on main typically will expect one main content block. And using landmark navigation to jump to it, they might not necessarily know that there's additional mains. Uh, certainly no assistive technology that I'm aware of exposes that there are more than one main element per page. Um, and one thing you don't want to do to your users is make them start to think that your landmark navigation is a lie because you have way too many of a particular element all over the site. Um, there, there is some debate about whether or not there should be more than one main, but that debate is limited to a very, um, uh, very small group of people. And for the most part, uh, users have been very clear. It makes sense to only have one. So let's just stick with that. Source order matters. This is another thing that I think um, a lot of people forget about. And this is going to become more relevant as we start to mess around with um, flex and grid. So the screenshot I have here is two animated GIFs and one of them shows Firefox and one of them shows Chrome and it shows uh, me tabbing through a series of boxes and the order in which I'm tabbing through them between those two browsers is different and what's making them difference, different is um, one of them is honoring how the elements appear in the source order and the other one is honoring how the elements appear based on the flex order property. So I'm not going to make a statement about which is right or which is wrong. I think it's more important that as a developer, you take a look at how the page flows. So if I'm tabbing through the page or if the page is being spoken to me by a screen reader, does it flow as I expect? Right now there are already some techniques via CSS that allow the visual order to be inconsistent with the DOM order. 
Um, floats is one of the easiest ones. You can float something and it doesn't necessarily appear on screen in the order you expect it to appear when you're tabbing through the page. Absolute positioning is an easy one. Uh, but this is becoming more of an issue with Flexbox and with Grid because this, this is starting to become more common in discussions for people who want to completely reorder how things appear on their page so that they can code it in whatever order they want and have it appear dramatically differently. Um, mostly because I think some developers feel it gives them flexibility and others think it allows them to quickly um, restructure a page with a new design very easily. And there's no value judgment there. It's just important that you recognize that we already have the potential to break the source order versus the, the visual order, um, that relationship, and it's going to become even more prominent as we start to pick up some of these new techniques. Um, there are some WCAG techniques related to this. Uh, 132 and 243 talk about how that meaningful sequence and tab order must match the visual flow. So at the very least, you know, pay attention to those and, and take a look at what those criteria talk about because they give a little bit better context when you're doing an audit or an evaluation. Um, but most easily, you could just pop into a browser, tab through the page, and if the browsers are behaving differently, make sure that you are accounting for that somehow. Tab index. I have a screenshot here that's showing a page where as soon as I start tabbing, it jumps me to the bottom of the page immediately into a captcha field or a recaptcha field. And this is important because the recaptcha by default uses tab index one on the very first element um, and then goes through one, two, three, four, five or so. So in this screenshot animation, um, the skip to page content doesn't even become available until probably my sixth click, which is incredibly frustrating. So the general rule of thumb here is don't use a tab index value greater than zero. Um, use a tab index negative one if you want to set focus with script. One nice thing about uh, tab index negative one is it does not put the element in the tab order of the page. It just makes it available for you to access it with script. Tab index zero is, is pretty powerful because it allows the user to set focus um, and it puts it in the tab order of the page. So you might see this technique is used in some cases for skip links. Otherwise, uh, due to some current browser bugs, uh, long-standing ongoing browser bugs, you could skip links, but the tab, uh, but the focus while the page may jump the tab focus doesn't change, so the very next time you hit the tab key, it jumps you right back up to the top of the page. Um, in general, just don't use a tab index of one or greater. It's going to mess with the tab order, and as I tried to demonstrate in that previous screen, it can be really frustrating. Now, having said that, uh, maybe do consider using tab index zero in some very specific circumstances. So I have two, two cases here that um, are influenced by a project I was working on where the client has a grid of data that is scrolling. So when the, um, when the text is too large for a cell, then a scroll bar appears. And they had another variation where uh, the grid was clipped with an ellipsis. And in order to see the remaining content, you had to mouse over it. The problem with both of those is that the user could, uh, I'm sorry, the keyboard user could never get to that content. Keyboard user can't hover to see what the full text is in the grid. And a keyboard user can't put focus in the cell in order to uh, activate the scroll bars with the, with the arrow keys. And that's a real problem. So I made a, I made a demo uh, on CodePen to, to show this in action. But, um, and I have it linked in my slides, so you'll see that as well. So one technique is you could, and this technique, by the way, Steve Faulkner put together and I happily stole and used in this way, um, you could take that container uh, or maybe throw in a new container like a div and throw the tab index zero on it and now the keyboard user can give it focus. You can throw an ARIA label on it if appropriate just to manage the expectation. You might want to give it a role of region depending on what you're doing with it. Um, and I have some of that written up in my post as well. Uh, button inputs or anchors. Uh, I think 
I think it was Michal's talk that I slept through because um, it was nighttime here, who, who talked about this, and, and I touch on it obviously here as well because this is pretty common whenever I look at libraries or how people are building things. Um, how people are building things. Pretty much everybody, it seems now. So I have a screenshot here showing a button and input and an anchor all styled to look exactly the same. Visually, there's no difference. Um, I have a code pen where I, where I played around with it so you could also see what happens. But first, I think most importantly, don't use a div, don't use a span, don't, don't use a, a heading and then put an on click on it. Find the appropriate element. Uh, one thing to consider with an anchor is if the control is going to take you to another URL, even an anchor further down the page, then use an ahref. It's worth noting that that doesn't fire when the user hits the spacebar. Um, it only fires on the enter key. If the control changes something on the current page, use a button. If the control submits a form, a pile of form fields, use input type submit or button type submit. I have always counseled people to use the input type submit because of the, the um, cognitive dissonance of using a button in the middle of a form versus an input which seems to flow already with their, uh, the, the fields, the, um, I'm sorry, the HTML elements that they are already using. Um, set the lang attribute on your HTML. Um, I have an example, this one's animated, that shows um, a number field that steps through different values. One of the fields is in Norwegian, or two of the fields are in Norwegian and two of them are in English. And I use these because in Norway, the decimal character is a comma. And in many European countries, the decimal character is a comma. In the US, it's a period. So by using the appropriate Lang uh, attribute with the correct language code, the fields know whether they should be stepping up in um, smaller amounts or not, and it keeps the appropriate delimiter in place. So while that's really handy when you're dealing with numbers, and I feel like I'm not explaining that well, but for time reasons, I'm just gonna skip that. Um, so while it has value for numbers, it's I think it's more important because it affects how screen readers will read the page. So voiceover, is going to voiceover and NVDA will use it to auto switch voices and use appropriate accenting. JAWS is going to load the phonetic engine and phonologic, phonologic dictionary that's appropriate for the language. Um, what's nice is um, you can play with this very easily by changing the language attribute, the lang attribute on the HTML element, and hearing uh, how the page is pronounced and listening to a French page with a Scottish accent or an English page with a French accent is hilarious. And, and I'm sorry, I'm surprised rather that nobody is doing comedy skits on that and they probably aren't because it will not be funny. Um, don't disable Zoom. Whatever you do, don't disable Zoom. And there are a lot of ways to disable Zoom, so don't do them. Uh, I have a couple screenshots here that shows one page um, with the Zoom disabled and a very tiny picture of Bill Murray. And because the picture is so small, you can't read the text that's embedded in it. The other screenshot, I have a loud zoom and I can zoom all the way in. And well, Bill Murray thinks you're awesome is the gist there. So it's important to allow users on mobile to zoom in. Um, this deals with uh, you know working in bright sunlight and the contrast is an issue. It deals with terrible images like the one I showed you with embedded text. It deals with all kinds of scenarios. So the first thing you should do to address this is look in the meta tag. If you see a meta name viewport, take out any minimum scale one, maximum scale one, and user scalable, no. Remove those, it's a pretty easy fix. There are some cases where people are using the at MS viewport um, uh, method in the CSS to, to manage Zoom. If you see that, look for the Zoom 1.0 and gut that as well. And as I note in my slides, once you do that, you can make the awesome and hilarious joke of shouting enhance while you pinch zoom on your mobile phone. I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to pause for laughter here. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, use captions and subtitles. Whenever possible, use captions and subtitles. And I should probably add the word transcripts in here too, because ultimately they're 
all to me at least the same concept. Uh, I have a screenshot of the No More Craptions site, which shows um, the auto captions that YouTube put for a talk I was giving in Sweden. And what I love is that the current caption reads, while so long to his Viagra. I, I don't know what that means. I really don't. It's probably terrible stuff. Um, I also have a, a screenshot of a YouTube video from The Lady Vanishes, and it's the full movie, and it has audio description and closed captions, and it has it in Spanish as well as English. And it's a good example of being able to watch a full-length movie with all that information embedded in it, very easy to access. Um, I think it's worth noting that everybody uses captions and subtitles. Um, certainly if you're working in public or somewhere where it's too loud or surfing on a train or on a plane or in a bar or whatever, uh, you'll find that they become pretty valuable. Um, your captions and subtitles should also include audio descriptions, you know, telling somebody about important sounds that are relevant to what's happening, should include speaker identification wherever possible. Uh, what's nice is that you can use the No More Craptions site, nomorecraptions.com, to review and edit your captions. Um, so you can remove any awkward Viagra references. Um, make sure that your audio and video clips have text alternatives and build links that are separate. Um, Maybe they're in the, the player, but also separate links to any transcripts that you have so people can get their hands on them. And in my slides, I link to some, tool, some tools that you can use for YouTube captioning and Vimeo captioning, et cetera. Um, I, I feel like um, Ian Devlin has just written some, some good stuff in the last few days on WebVTT as well. So I should probably reference his I don't know the URLs, but you should go check out what Ian's been writing this week. Uh, test in Windows high contrast mode. It's amazing how many people forget that this is a thing. Um, remember that Windows high contrast mode will remove the CSS background images, at least currently. Um, uh, coming release of Edge addresses that by leaving the image but putting a, a big high contrast block around the text so the text doesn't get lost in the image. Um, Bear in mind that colors defined in your CSS are overridden. They're just tossed away. You can quickly um, activate high contrast mode on a Windows machine by holding down the left alt key, the left shift key, and pressing the print screen key. Quickly drops you in. You get to see what happens in a page. You'll find that Internet Explorer is the browser that honors this uh, for the most part, so give it a test there. There are media queries that you can use to help select uh, the MS high contrast uh, selector, um, uh, sorry, term, thinger, style. Oh, okay, my brain is failing here. So MS high contrast, active is one value, black on white is another, and white on black is another value. And you can use that to tweak your styles as appropriate. Um, you're not going to be able to set colors, but you can certainly change around things like sizing and clean up some positioning. Um, avoid infinite scroll. I have an animated screen capture here of me on a page trying to get to the footer. And uh, I start off just by scrolling the page, and then I give up and start hitting the page down key, and then start hitting the end key, and I can never, ever get to the page footer. It's the, it's the worst trick ever. It's like, it's like Lucy and Charlie Brown kicking that damn football. So the problem with infinite scroll is it makes it impossible for some users to access the footer, any sidebar links, um, that page in particular, you, you filter the search based on links in the sidebar. So if you're a keyboard user, you can never filter them. Um, it destroys the back button. It makes it impossible to share the URL to a specific page of results. It makes it impossible to jump ahead. Um, you know, you know you're, you're in an alphabetic search and you want to get to the letter L. You just can't get there unless you're prepared to scroll a lot. And certainly if you're using assistive technology, if you're using a, a, a mobile phone or a computer that's um, pretty low spec or even reasonably well spec, um, it can overwhelm the page and it can overwhelm the entire device and cause it to not overheat, but certainly not perform very well. How am I doing on time? Oh, I'm great on time. I got like two hours to go. Um, reconsider typeface, typefaces for dyslexia. I have a screenshot here that's flipping between a page that's using open dyslexic and just using regular text. 
this one's a bit tougher. I'm not going to explicitly say don't use typefaces for dyslexia because there are many users who get value from using these typefaces. However, creating a scenario where you just pass it on to the user doesn't necessarily help. So instead of trying to solve any problems you think you're having by setting a typeface and just assuming that will take care of it, just use good typography rules. You know, avoid, avoid justified text. That's where it's aligned both left and right. Just avoid that. Make sure that you have good line spacing or, or letting as we used to call it when there was a thing called print. Um, use good letter spacing. Avoid italics. In general, use sans serif faces. Um, use larger text with good contrast and use clear and concise writing. Um, this doesn't mean that you can't, th this doesn't mean that if you do all these, your users, your readers still won't have problems. But it does mean that the need for a custom typeface is probably greatly reduced. Um, and if you really want to mess with them, I have been told that Comic Sans is great for some people to read. I disagree with that, as, as you should as well. Um, when it comes to image descriptions, those long form descriptions, whether you use a long desk or whether you just have an additional um, text version of the image as a hyperlink, use it on the page. Don't, don't link somebody to a whole different page. Um, so if you have a, a very large graphic with lots of text and you want to recreate that text, don't send the user elsewhere. Just put it as an anchor further down the page. And this is valuable because um, you're, you're removing the burden of causing the user to load a new page and then having to go back and reload the original page. And it, it sounds pretty simple. And I initially encountered this when looking through um, the WebAIM screen reader survey results from 2015. And after I did a little bit of testing, I found that it's incredibly frustrating, incredibly frustrating to be reading a page, you encounter an image, you have the opportunity to get a text alternative for the image, you click the link, and you've lost where you were in the page. You're, you're now elsewhere. Uh, assistive technology might be speaking everything on the page, again, that you don't need. And then when you go back, same scenario, you're starting all over again. That can be incredibly annoying. Um, you may have heard me about a year ago talking about not using the search role on forms. That's okay now. That's all been taken care of. Um, go ahead, use the role search on forms. Um, and that's primarily because a bunch of bugs were filed uh, against the spec and against the um, HTML checker. And that has all been fixed up. It's good to go. It's totally legal. So consider this uh, a bit of a retraction on what I had written before, which was totally accurate then and, and not so totally accurate now. Um, getting a little bit outside of the web-specific stuff, maybe try not to tweet pictures of text. I have some examples here from three people who, who tweet pictures of text semi-regularly. One of them is Alton Brown. And I like his method where he will respond to a tweet by writing an answer on a post-it and sticking it to his screen and taking a picture of that and posting it. It's funny. Um, it's just problematic because for the most part, your users aren't going, and I'm sorry, for the most part, your users who can't see the images for whatever reason aren't going to know what the hell you're writing. Um, what's nice, though, is that Twitter has recently added the feature to add image descriptions. So maybe instead of trying not to tweet pictures of text, maybe make it a point to always include an image description when you're tweeting a picture. And I have three screenshots here of me tweeting um, my working on the slides yesterday and adding an image description in the app on Android. Um, for now, you must be using one of the apps, although I think TweetBot and, and maybe another one now support it as well. It's worth noting that that alternative text is not exposed on the web, though. Um, it's also not in any Twitter backup, so if you download your Twitter archive, it's not there yet. Granted, I haven't checked in a few days. Um, so for people to get that alternative text, they have to be using an app that supports it. Supposedly, Twitter is working on bringing that to the, the website as well. In the meantime, you can still follow some best practices for alternative text on tweets. Reply to your own tweet with the description. Um, link to another tweet and provide the image description or link to a, a page that maybe has some long-form alternative text. Oh, no, 
tweet to what? Okay, I should not look at what people are tweeting me because I can't see the entire text. Um, one thing that I've been promoting for years, we, we really need to share our accessibility experiences more. Um, I, I have uh, screenshots from a Medium article, the five goofy, five goofy things Medium did that break accessibility, and Podio, or, or Podio, I never hear people say it out loud in real life. Uh, their headline was, How Some Hard Truths Helped Us Start Improving the Podio Experience for the Visually Impaired. And I, I think it's worth noting that um, Ultimately, if you're working in accessibility, and if you're not working in accessibility, but you're listening today, for example, we're, we're really all trying to do what we can. The, the technology is moving rapidly. The techniques are moving rapidly. The best, best practices are changing pretty regularly, especially a great example is the role search, which I championed up until it got fixed or changed, rather. And, you know, boom, now the stuff I wrote uh, a year ago is essentially a lie even though I've corrected it. So, you know, maybe let's not attack everybody who doesn't know what they don't know. Uh, in particular, I've found that just because I think I know the answer to something, somebody else will often find uh, an aspect of it I hadn't considered and give me feedback on something that just never, never came across my mind. So what I really like is when people are willing to share what they've done right, what they've done wrong, and the lessons they've learned, and certainly listening to um, talks in the last few hours, save for the few I slept through. Um, there's a lot of really good information. Um, I think hour three, Sarah had an entire talk dedicated to that, which was just brilliant to listen to, um, and for, through which I should have been sleeping to prepare for this. Um, I like the accessibility wins Tumblr that Marcy Sutton put together, a11ywins.tumblr.com. It's got some neat stuff in there. I think she just added a couple yesterday. Um, it's, it's a good example of how uh, even when there are things wrong with the examples that she puts in there, she's making the effort to champion what they have done right, or at least what they've tried to do right. And for somebody like me who is on sort of my setting is permanently grumpy, it's good to be reminded of that because I certainly don't always follow my own advice. So um, I have some key takeaways from all of this, and, and I didn't do a good job of explaining my common theme, but I'm going to explain it now. Ultimately, accessibility is not a checklist. Um, I have the example of the, the, the ramp blended into the stairs that I like to show in all my talks that uh, I've seen used again and again as an example of how you can blend accessibility into everyday things and it works really well. The problem is when you treat it like a checklist like they did with this ramp and these stairs, you create a dangerous experience, uh, primarily for wheelchair users who can not get up the ramp without falling backwards or get down the ramp without careening into a wall, but also for people who are walking up the stairs who stumble every seventh step or so because they're then tripping through a ramp. Instead, we need to think of accessibility as an ongoing process. Just because you build it into the product launch, for example, doesn't mean that you, you're done. Any subsequent changes, any updates, additions still need to be considered. Um, Nick Steenhout has a uh, photo he posted a while back that shows the wheelchair ramp to his pharmacy during the winter, which while they had uh, cleared it of snow, they put two potted plants on the ramp. So they satisfied the checklist, and it probably worked great all summer, but as soon as they put two plants on the ramp to get them out of the snow, that completely broke that affordance that they had built. So. Um, to quote Oslo Davis and this cartoon that I like, we have time for just one long-winded self-indulgent self question that relates to nothing we've been talking about. Um, I think I have seven minutes to take questions based on how much activity I have not seen. I don't know what there is, so I'm going to leave it to the moderators to field those. And when I am done with all of this, I will tweet out the URL to my slides. Uh, but I can tell you now that rosel.li slash id24 is the URL where they will live. And um, so now, guys, moderators, yep. do I just stop sharing? You can. Oh, infinite sharing. Whoa. You can if you want to. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing the slides so everybody can. Oh, wait. Everybody can see me now, can't they? Yes. Oh, you still got your clothes on. That's always good. Right, thank you very much. Uh, let me just have a look. I don't think we had any questions coming in. You obviously answered everything. Uh, let's see. So, obviously, I answered everything. 
everything. No, I can't see any questions on here. Let's check the Twitter sphere. Uh, we we do have a, um, a. I was going to point out everybody here is wearing a red T-shirt. That's the official uniform. Indeed. Sh shame TPG's color is blue, but you know we'll, we'll change. We'll change it in post. It's fine. Whatever. Sorry, Ian. We have a tweet from uh, from uh, uh, Ian Devlin who says that he's written uh, two posts. One which is uh, help with web VTT, and the other which is HTML5 video and multiple track display. Yes. So um, and I, I'm, we'll see that in the uh, hashtag in my talk. So yes, please yep. do tweet those out because those are those are great uh, great posts and the timing that he wrote those is perfect, at least yeah. for today. And and I'll also mention on the same topic on the same person. Uh, I know that Ian absolutely loves when people out of the blue email him with really complex questions about VTT and expect him to just uh, for free uh, do uh, you know online help and consultation. So. Please feel free to just you know spam his uh, inbox. I'm, I'm sure you'll appreciate it. Yeah, what I'll do is I'll change my opening slide to his email address, <laughs> and um, he'll 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 love that. That'll be perfect. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think uh, in that case, I don't think there's anything outstanding. Uh, all that's left to say is thank you very much, Adrian, and oh. uh, everybody else on the stream. We'll take a, a short break just to set everything up for the next speaker. And uh, we'll see you shortly, hopefully. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks for playing. Bye. <laughs> now what?